This story has been recorded at an Addictive Eaters Anonymous meeting in New Zealand. You can email us at contact at aeanz.org. So, it's the first Friday of the month for speaker meeting, and I would like to ask Janelle to come up here. My name's Janelle, and I'm a addictive eater. Hi, Hi Janelle. Janelle. Um, right, let me cast my mind back. Um, I was born an addictive eater, and um, I always blamed, for a long, long time, I blamed mum. It was mum's fault. Because mum had gestational diabetes, and I weighed nine pounds ten. And I was a big baby, and I was a very hungry baby, apparently, and I just kept going. So if mum hadn't had that, and I wasn't so big, I wouldn't have, you know. But it wasn't because of that. It's because I've got the disease of addiction. And, um, and food... You know, there was never there was never enough. You know, in my mind, I wasn't born with an off switch, and um, I was always hungry. If you'd have asked me, I said I was always hungry, and there's no way I could have ever been hungry because I ate constantly. So people who eat as much as I do are, are never hungry. Um, but it never stopped. You know, I always I always ate. I had this need to eat, and I. Later on, you know, I, I said to myself, probably in my middle twenties, it's like I'm a drug addict with food, you know, and the, the more I ate, the more I needed, and I needed bigger amounts to get the same effect. And um, so I was born in Timaru, and um, I've got two younger sisters, and um, I was a very quiet child, very introverted, very um, very quiet. There's three years between me and my younger, my next sister down, and there's 11 months between the two younger ones. So, um, you know, mum was very busy with those two. And, um, and I think, you know, for her it was a relief because they were very hyperactive children and I wasn't, you know, and I didn't. Um, I didn't walk till I was 15 months old. I just sat like a wee Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, and then I was just, you know, I never, I never did anything. You know, I just, I was a very placid child. I think that was, you know, very good for mum to be so placid. But, um, so we grew up, we lived in Timaru, moved, went to Christchurch when I was 10. And, you know, my memories of that time are, you know, my earliest memories are food memories. They're not family memories, they're food memories. And I can remember being a preschooler and given, was probably Christmas or my birthday, a little cooking set with a little pot, a couple of little pots, a little spatulas and a little frying pan. And they were metal. And I knew that those metal, that metal frying pan went on the stove. So I can remember pulling a chair over to the bench, getting up, and turning the element on to cook whatever it was I was going to cook. Because I knew then that's what you did with them. You didn't play on your little pretend little <laughs> stove. Because, you know, you put it on the stove and you, you know, how does it, you know? But I knew that's what you did with them back then. And, um, you know, those memories, preschool being taken to play centre in town and mum would drop me off and I couldn't play because I thought she's not coming back to pick me up. And I would sit rooted in spot looking at the door the whole time. I could not play. And you know, maybe some normal children, they'd have that experience of, you know, being unsettled because mum had left them. But you know, after a few days it would get better I'm sure, but it never did. Never ever got better. And I used to dread being taken there. Couldn't play. And the other really strong memory of that time is going to um, must have been a different must have been a di I can't remember what it was anyhow. There was a cake anyhow. Maybe it was that maybe it was that that um, play centre. But when it was your birthday they had a cake with candles on it. But what it was, was a biscuit tin, turned upside down, covered in icing, 
with hundreds and thousands on it that you couldn't eat. But it had, it had birthday candles on it, so they trotted it out and then you blew the candles out. But I was so disappointed because I knew that you couldn't eat this. What was the point? What was the point of having a cake, an artificial cake, you know? And, um, and you, you know, I wanted to lick the hundreds and thousands off it. You know, don't put the damn thing back. Let me, you know, lick the hundreds and thousands, scrape them off, for goodness sake. And um, so, you know, I went to school and, um, you know, just couldn't wait to go home, really hated going to school. And then we moved to Christchurch and um, I got strap on the first day because I asked someone what was, we were supposed to be doing and the teacher said, who was that talking? You know, so, oh. But, um, so I never talked again, you know, for fear of getting the strap. But the best thing about primary school was the fish and chip orders at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Love the fish and chip orders. So you got this little um, Formica wee sample that had your order on it. So you go before school and you'd order your and I'd have it in my desk, and I'd have to keep checking that it was there, you know, the whole time. I don't know where I thought it was going to go, whether someone was, but you know, and just the highlight of the week, you know, those, and they'd be all soggy because they'd been cooked for ages, and they all sweated, <laughs> and the batter fell off the fish, and it was all, you know. But gee, I loved that, and um, and the other good day was when we got chip sandwiches, you know, and I'd eat my, I'd pick the chips out on the way to school. Um, and I just have my white Vegemite chips, and I just have the plain Vegemite sandwiches, you know, when I got to school. And, um, you know, getting up in the night to sneak down, Mum was a good baker, and I'd get up in the night and sneak down to the biscuit tins and have something to eat, and then I'd sneak back to bed, and then I'd lie there and then I'd sneak back down. And this would go on, you know, a few times, and then I'd realise there was a gap in the biscuit where I'd, so then I'd have to rearrange them, and like, Every mother knows, mum never said anything, I can't believe it, that mum never ever said, you know, who's been eating the biscuits, because you could see, even though I'd spread them out, you could still tell, you know, they were missing, and um, frozen things, frozen saveloys out of the freezer, um, mum and dad would go, you know, until I got old enough to stay at home, there'd be the Sunday drive, and then I liked it when I got old enough that I didn't have to go on the Sunday drive, and I'd either cream butter and sugar together, or I'd make meringues with egg white and icing sugar and, you know, and eat that quickly while, you know, while the family were away, and then it was my job on a Sunday to make the jelly, we'd have a roast lunch, but the trouble was, you know, when you ate, the mix, you know, the jelly, and you topped it up with water, it never set, <laughs> because I had to build it up to, the, you know, and mum never said anything, you know, I can't believe she didn't say anything, but she never did. Um, so, you know, I, I was overweight as a very early child, really, um, you know, that eating. Um, I... Um, you know, along with my eating, you know, I, I look at the first step that we we're powerless over food and our lives are unmanageable. Along with my, you know, my eating was, you know, the fact that I was cripplingly shy and self-conscious, um, scared, you know, I can remember, um, you know, along with the thinking I was never going to be picked up from, from play centre, you know, irrational fears, you know, I had a, an after-school job um, in town at Woolworths and you know I'd come home on a Friday night and you know I was well when I turned the light off I had to jump to my bed because I thought there was something under the bed you know and when you're 17 <laughs> be scared of things under your bed but I was you know I was scared of something under the bed was going to get me and um so, um, you know, these crazy, crazy fears, you know, crazy, crazy fears. And, you know, I went to intermediate. Um, I had one school friend who I met when I was at primary school. She just lived around the corner. And she was my only friend at the time through high school. And, um, and I was sort of on the periphery of a group of really nice girls. And they, they included me, but I was never one of them never one of them, you know, I always felt 
different and um, you know I had my Woolworths job and um, I just I fantasised about being locked in overnight you know and being able to eat the pick and mix you know and um, I had a holiday job they put me in the deli and you know all my food all my jobs prior to coming here were in food related and you know I had a job in the deli and you know I'd be to make sandwiches, you know, and I'd be under the counter and I'd have my mouth chock full of whatever coleslaw and stuff, and then I'm sort of coming up and <laughs> trying to eat coleslaw, you know, and um, just crazy, 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 crazy. Um, so I had my money, had my first own money then to spend, so, you know, I'd buy big bags of lollies and things and, you know, take them home with me, and um, I never bought anything. I never, all I bought was food. I had nothing to show. I think I bought a lipstick once. Mm -hmm. But all those years of working, I never saved it. And, um, you know, others would be, you know, going out to the other staff on a Friday night, they'd be going out to listen to music or, or whatever. And I just wanted to go home with my bag of lollies, you know, and missed all that. Um, so, you know, there was always the food, always, always the food, and um, and there was always me, you know, and I, when I was at Intermediate, I thought, I thought, I fantasised about losing weight over the holidays and coming back slim, you know, the next year, and, um, and one of the girls, one of my friends, did that, and, and uh, you know, she was sort of, um, yeah, I don't know whether they call it puppy fat or what they, I don't know what they call it, but she lost weight and came back and, um, and you know, everyone was just sort of swarmed around her and, and you know, just thought it was wonderful and I was so jealous because I couldn't, I knew I couldn't do that. So, um, you know, my eating's, my eating, I'm getting bigger because, you know, I kept eating and then when I went to high school, um, the wheels really fell off then because, you know, you were expected to be a bit more independent and, um, you know, and there was the timetable was different and it was like a, a seven day timetable so you had two days of the seven and the next week and then it started, oh, I never knew what day it was, I knew it was Tuesday or Wednesday but what, what day was it, you know, and I was completely baffled by it and, um, you know, there was, you know, the older the older forms, the older children, you know, I couldn't cope with that, you know, you're expected to be independent and, um, you know, I couldn't cope, I couldn't cope at intermediate, I certainly couldn't cope at primary school and, you know, I couldn't cope at high school and, you know, that anxiety, I developed alopecia and I had a, you know, a big ball patch on my head, so I'm a, I'm a fat kid with a ball patch on their head, you know, as if you're not self-conscious enough. <laughs> You know, and, and I just wanted to hide. I wanted to hide all the time. So I I hid and I ate, you know, and I kept thinking that when, you know, when I lose weight, I'll be fixed and I'll know, suddenly life will make sense and I'll know how to do things and, you know, know how you have a boyfriend and I'll know what work I want to do and, you know, um, you know, later on sort of thought, well, you know, people travelled, how did they know where they wanted to go, you know. Um, so life, you know, very isolated, very lonely, um, eating, 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 thinking, you know, when I'm a normal size, I'll be, I'll be fixed. So when I was in my late teens, I went to the doctor and told her, my, you know, my dim, dirty secret that, you know, I couldn't stop eating all the time. And she suggested that I got a hobby. Actually, two things, get a hobby, and she said, eat um, homemade baking, don't buy, don't eat bought biscuits. I don't know why she said that, because, you know, so I could bake, you know, trust me, I could bake. I was a baker, I, you know, learnt mum's, inherited mum's baking skills, and... So, you know, um, so the hobby didn't help, hobby didn't help, and, um, and I tried dieting, but I couldn't stick to it, I could not stick to it, I wasn't an exerciser, I ran around the block once, 
got up at six o'clock in the morning and vomited in the gutter <laughs> and had dreadful cramps and thought, well, that's it, I'm not doing that again, you know. So I tried to diet um, with no success. And um, so, you know, I've always worked in food places, bakeries and delis and um, did a lot, a lot of eating. You know, when my first job leaving school was in a bakery and I said to myself, I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to eat anything. So that probably lasted into the second day. <laughs> and, you know, I was responsible for icing the slices and the biscuits and, and whatnot. And, you know, you had the trimmings. You didn't cut right to the end of the tray. There was a, a gadget that cut it into squares. And, you know, it didn't count. You know, when I ate those trimmings, that didn't count as eating because it wasn't real cake, it was just trimmings. And if I ate things out of the pig bin, you wanted the things from the top, because the things at the bottom had gone mouldy, but you know, you ate the things from the top. That wasn't eating either, because that was out of the pig bin. And if you just ate the pastry off the sausage rolls, that wasn't eating, because it wasn't a sausage roll, it was just pastry. <laughs> and um, if you ate the frozen savouries in the cooler, that wasn't eating either because they were cold, they weren't heated. So, you know, that was my reasoning there. And, um, you know, every year I needed a new smock because I couldn't bend the arms because it was so tight. And every year, you know, we got a new smock, but I always needed a bigger size smock. And... Um, and, you know, I started work at 8 o'clock and I would leave from work at 5 to 8 and get there at 8 o'clock. I probably got up at 10 to 8, <laughs> um, picked my grubby smock up off the floor and put that on and went to work. And um, thought, by golly, they're lucky to have me here. <laughs> don't expect me to work. I've turned up. That was my attitude. I've turned up. Don't expect me to work. By golly. Um, and the minute the boss's back was turned, I was just mucking around and, you know, I took my knitting to work. <laughs> I was supposed to be cleaning this bakery in the afternoon, I'd sit there knitting. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so not a very good employee, was I. So I left there and I um, went to work at a cake decorating place after that. And um, so... Um, I met my husband, my now ex-husband, at that bakery and um, I thought, well, I'd better have him because no one else will have me. I didn't like him, but I thought, well, no one else will have me, you know, and um, so we got married and um, had our own home and, you know, I'd lived at home. I wasn't able to leave home and flat because I was too fearful, you know, I didn't know how you'd even do that, so... Um, so then I had my own home and I didn't have mum there saying, don't you think you've had enough, you know, because I could eat all I liked then. And he worked night shift, which was very convenient. He started work at six o'clock at night and came home at six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, we'd been there probably a couple of months in our new home and my aunt and uncle came to visit and my aunt says, gosh, marriage is agreeing with you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What she meant was, God, you've got fat. You know, but I had free reign. I could cook, you know, I could cook and eat to my heart's content. And um, so I'm getting bigger and I'm getting, um, I'm getting bigger and I'm feeling more and more hopeless, you know, more self-conscious because I didn't want to, I didn't want to eat the way I ate. And um, I'll go back to the doctor. She gave me some diet pills um, and, um, I really liked those diet pills. They didn't stop me eating and I didn't use them for that. I used them to feel good and feel happy. And um, which they did. They really, really did. And um, I knew when they ran out, I knew I wasn't going back to get any more because I really did love them. I really, really did. And I thought that's not good for me, you know, having them. So um, I thought, well, when I have a baby, I'll feel better. You know, I always thought when the next thing happens, I'll, I'll feel better. So, um, I was pregnant and I read lots of baby books because I wanted to be a good mother. Um, but unfortunately, our son hadn't read the same books that I'd read. And um, he had colic and he'd start crying about 7 o'clock 
until about 10 o'clock and you know my, my husband would go to work at 6 o'clock and he'd ring and, and um, say here and things, oh no I'm fine, you know, things are fine and you know I couldn't stop this baby crying and I just felt completely useless as a, as a mother. I had postnatal depression, I had, could, you know, I'd had this baby, I couldn't stop crying so I put him to bed and I wanted to smother him. I just wanted him to stop crying and um, and I felt grateful. I thought you can't tell if you want to smell all that's, you know, um, you know. So um, I felt dreadful, absolutely dreadful. So um, couldn't stop crying all the time. So it wasn't a happy time, you know. It certainly wasn't a happy time. And I went to the doctor and um, was given antidepressants, which I didn't take. You know, I didn't take them. Um, and I'm eating more. I'm feeling miserable. Oh, I'm feeling not feeling, you know, feeling dreadful. Um, so I'm eating, and I'm getting bigger. And you know, the more I ate, the worse I felt, and the worse I felt, the more I ate. So it just went round and round and round and round and round. And um, so then um, we had another baby, and you know, same thing again. He didn't have colic, but um, you know. I've got postnatal depression again, you know, I can't stop crying, you know, and, you know, when I was single, I couldn't look after myself, you know, I couldn't manage my life, and then I've got one child, and I can't manage, you know, when I was, you know, he'd been delivered, you know, and they handed to me, and all I could, all I felt was fear, it's like, oh my God, what do I do with this, you know, what, what am I going to do now, you know, and I can't give it back, and, um, so then, you know, so I'm not coping with one child, then, you know, can't cope with two children. Um, I was withdrawn and isolated. Um, you know, the house, the house was a hovel. You know, just um, absolutely. You know, just a really, really sad place to be. And all I could see of my life was this black hole getting blacker. And that's, you know, that's all I could see. And tucked away in the back of my mind, I still thought that when I'm a normal size, I'll be fixed and I won't want to eat all the time. And um, what got me to this fellowship was losing weight, going with a friend to a diet club. And to, and I lost the weight, I, you know, got to a normal size and um, still wanted to eat all the time. And people were saying to me, gosh, you look wonderful. Gee, you must feel so good. And I felt no different because it hadn't stopped the wanting to eat. And um, so I'm walking around then saying, well, what is the answer? Because I knew then that dieting wasn't the answer. And um, the library display was at our local library. And I picked up a 15 questions pamphlet and took it home and um, showed my husband and said, do you think this sounds like me? And I detected 14 out of 15 of them. And um, he said, oh no, you're not that bad. Because you know, people couldn't see, you know, and I'd say to you, gosh, I just need to look at food and I put on weight. But there was a jolly sight more than looking at it going on. And I couldn't eat the amounts that I needed to eat in front of people. So my eating was all done in secret. And um, so I rang someone, um, which was very brave of me. I don't quite know how I accomplished that, but I did. And um, she shared her story with me, and I really didn't relate. I did, and I was, I felt embarrassed for her because I thought she's telling me all this stuff about herself that you know, and I would have never told anyone about myself. And the only reason I came was because she said she asked me would I like to come to a meeting, and because I couldn't say no, I said yes. And you know. Um, came to a meeting and here for the first time were other people like me because I thought I was the only one who ate the way I ate and um, felt very ashamed and very guilty about that and um, you know and and I'd, I'd you know I'd been to the diet clubs and I'd been to you know a couple of other places and been to the doctor and and but they hadn't helped been to Weight Watchers and but I hadn't I hadn't I didn't 
they hadn't been able to help me. And here for the first time, you know, the people here, the members shared their stories and I related. And first of all, I related to the way they ate. And then I related to the way they felt and thought. And I thought, I'm like that. Um, and I kept, you know, I kept coming and um, I got a sponsor and um, I didn't eat. I didn't eat for the first 15 months and I thought I was fixed because all I could see that was wrong with me was the weight and I didn't know about my unmanageable life. And then, you know, at 15 months I woke up one morning and I was just, you know, my head was like, you know, 50 radio stations and I just had to get on my knees and I just said to God, you know, you've got to help me. And, um, you know, I believe that's when step one happened and you know I became willing then to do the things I hadn't been willing to do before such as you know my sponsor saying you know are you ringing people and you know hand on my heart I could say I was but I would ring the people who weren't home because I didn't want to speak to them so I started doing all those things and you know did a fourth and fifth step and then went on and and made the amends um, but you know the fear was still there the fear of you know, the fear of eating was good because it, it drove me to do the things that I needed to do. But um, I, I just, I couldn't do step three. I couldn't hand my will and life over to the care of God. And, you know, that was a, another eight years later that that, that that happened in, you know, quite dramatic um, circumstances. And I was then in a, placed in a situation where I had no control over my eating. And, um, and um, you know, I'd heard here that God has either removed the problem or he hasn't. And I couldn't trust that that was true for me. And here I am in a situation where I've got no control over what I'm going to eat. And, um, and I was taken care of, you know, um, in that situation. And, you know, the meal that night was going to be fish and chips. And I thought, well, here we go. God's either removed the problem or he hasn't, and I'm going to have fish and chips for tea. And I've just got to trust that, you know, if the problem's been removed, it's going to, I'm going to be fine. And I was okay with that. I had no fear around that whatsoever. And, you know, um, a vegetarian meal arrived that no one had ordered. No one had ordered it. Out of 18 people, they were all having fish and chips. And... And I had that vegetarian meal and, you know, it was a damn sight closer to my food plan than fish and chips was. But if it was the fish and chips, you know, I just knew. And then that sort of um, a knowing developed from that. And I just knew then, from then on, whatever happened, I was going to be all right. And, um, and that's proven to be the case. And... Um, you know, those people at that first meeting, they had something that I was attracted to. There was the, the lightness, the brightness in their eyes, and um, they sort of had a glow, you know, a glow, an internal glow. And they talked about, um, they talked about coming to meetings, they talked about um, having a sponsor, um, they talked about working the steps, they talked about um, having a food plan, they talked about um, reading the big book and trying to help somebody else. And and they were simple things, you know, I could I could latch on to those things. And I didn't always understand what I was doing, but you know, you don't need to understand. Often the understanding has come later. And um, and it's just it's just one day at a time, you know. And, um, you know, all those one days, you know, those early days of wanting to eat, so, you know, that first year or so, 49% of me wanted to eat, but 51% didn't. And I just held on to the fact that I get through the day, don't pick up the first one, get to a meeting, put my head on the pillow, and it's another soap day. And I could do that. And all those one days at a time, and all that time passing, um, you know, my life along with, you know, members here is vastly different as well. And, you know, that crippling fear, you know, I don't have that anymore. And, um, you know, I have a, 
a sense of use and purpose, you know. Um, I get up in the morning and, you know, I've got a very, um, a very simple life, really, but, you know, it's a life in a way I would have wished for, you know, and that sense of ease and comfort, I always needed food to give me that, just to anaesthetise me and take life away, you know, take take everything away. And, you know, I ran from things, I never fronted up to things, and, you know, the the eighth and ninth step, you know, going back and making those amends, <coughs> and um, the things I stole, and, you know, all those, you know, the food I ate, and, you know, all those things that um, have been cleared away, and, um, you know, it's an ongoing process, and I really like that. I really, really like that it's ongoing, and, um, and you know, things are revealed. Things are revealed in God's time, and, you know, I have, have a sponsor that I can talk with things about, and, you know, be follow directions, and um, I was trying to think to myself, you know, could I give some examples of how life was different, and I couldn't. You know, well, everything's different. There's nothing about my life that's the same. But I couldn't really think of anything specific except from the fact that, you know, I get up every day and I clean the teeth and I have my breakfast and I go to work and I come home and I go to meetings. But there's a couple of different, couple of things that sort of came to mind this week. And um, one was um, things don't seem to throw me the way they used to. You know, when something doesn't go according to plan. I'm more able, you know, to go with it. And Wednesday night, um, Wednesday I spoke to my sponsor at 5 o'clock and then I had to get groceries on the way home. And just a, re a relatively recent thing for me, I'd always got my evening meal ready in the morning when I'm getting my lunch ready. So um, for one reason or another, uh, it just occurred to me I didn't actually need to do that because I had time when I got home from work to do that. So I stopped doing that and um, so I talked to my sponsor and then it's a bit, you know, just before about 20 past five and I'm leaving work to go and get my groceries before I come home and, you know, I could never have done that. I would have had to have come home and had my tea almost straight away. So that was fine, you know, that was a bit different. That was all right. So I get to the supermarket and do my shopping and then, oh, and I'm cheering the meeting, cheering Wednesday night's meeting. So, you know, I haven't got my tea ready, and then I'm going to the supermarket, and I get my groceries, and I get to the checkout, and I haven't got my EPOS card. I've left it at work. So, it's like, oh, well, I'll just go to work. So, you know, before I'd probably left my groceries, because I'm chewing the meeting, I've got to get home, and I've got to get my tea ready to get out the door to get to chew the meeting. So I go back to work, and I get my EPOS card, and I come back, and I pay for my groceries, and I go home, you know, and I cook my tea, and at no time am I worried that I'm not going to get to the meeting. You know, at no point does it bother me, and I know I'll be there on time. Um, so, you know, I go home and cook my tea, I get half the dishes done, because I did run out of time then, because I couldn't get them all done, you know, and I get to the meeting, and it's absolutely fine. And, you know, I worried about, you know, in the food, I worried about all these things, that would that might happen, you know, crippled by them, but things that might happen, and um, and nothing, you know, far worse things have happened in recovery than ever ever happened in my eating, and it's been fine, you know, and um, I really like, you know, I really really like that, you know, and I hear it described here, you know, people say it gets better, and I have heard that described as inner turmoil, you know, and um, what a gift that is, you know, what a gift that is to have that. And um, the other thing that's never happened before, which I found very exciting, I discovered the snooze button on my alarm clock. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew there's a snooze button? Because I've always had a problem with waking up early and getting up early. And when your day starts early, you're tired at the end of the day. And that's been a, you know, quite an ongoing thing for me. And, you know, last year some changes were suggested, which I've followed. And then um, 
this week the alarm went off and I thought, actually, I'm not ready to wake up. Actually. So I pushed it. I thought, oh, but how am I going to not, how am I going to, you know, not go back to sleep? And I think there's a snooze button on the alarm. And there was. And I pushed it twice. <laughs> and I had 20 minutes more sleep. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that was on a work day. You know, because I wasn't worried about getting up and I've got to get my breakfast and I've got to get to work and I don't want to be late and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's because I was tired and I needed that bit more sleep. And um, so, you know, they're funny things, but they're big things. You know, they're, they're big things for me. You know, someone whose life was um, crippled by fear and anxiety, you know, to just to have that, that peace of mind and that, um, you know, that sense that everything's okay. And, you know... It's available for anyone who comes here. That's available. Um, you know, we'd shortchange ourselves if, if all we had was just to stop eating. You know, but um, I'm grateful to be here. So thanks, Robin. Thanks, Jane.